I'm going to be showing you how you can take any wired USB keyboard and convert it to a Bluetooth wireless connection. I'm going to be going over all the steps and all the components you need, so please feel free if you want to follow along. If you are going to attempt this, please also pay attention to the second part of the video, where I'll be going more in-depth and technical and also showing you all of the mistakes I made along the way. This video is packed with info and I have a ton to show you, so let's go! It's so easy guys, are you ready? Plug this into this and then connect it to your computer via Bluetooth. That's it, you're done and it works. Look at that, no wires. This is the easiest tutorial yet. Literally your mom could do this. It's ugly, what wire? Oh, you mean that giant wire coming out of the back of the keyboard? Are you trying to say that this wasn't what you were expecting it to be? I'm just messing with you. Of course I'll show you how to make it look as clean as possible. The first thing you'll need is a USB keyboard. Duh! The keyboard I'll be using is a WASD Code V2B. This is a 10 keyless mechanical keyboard with MX Browns. The next component you'll need, which is what I like to call the magic box. This is the BT500 by Handheld Scientific. This tiny little adapter takes your USB signals and converts them to Bluetooth wireless signals, which can be received by just about any smartphone, laptop, desktop, tablet, you name it. Of course, there are some other BT modules out there, but this one just works. And lastly, because you're going wireless, you're going to need a power source, like a battery. Power banks have batteries and they also have charge circuits with 5 volts, which is just what you need. Even though I was joking earlier about using it like this, you definitely could. It's still a good idea to do this in the first first place just to make sure all the components work together before you start hacking and soldering. You should be able to make this work for any USB keyboard, but this tutorial is for this specific keyboard. To get into the case, rip off that warranty sticker and remove the singular screw. The case is held together by 12 clips. Start with the back 4 clips as I'm showing you here. Position the reflection of the light to more easily see them. Also start with the two innermost clips. With a screwdriver or pry tool, you're going to want to push hard enough to release the clips, but not so hard to break them. For the bottom four, you can just slide them without prying them. Now lift the PCB and detach the internal connector. Now unscrew the internal micro USB port and put it aside because we'll need it later. Next is disassembly of the magic box. Shove some screwdrivers in the side to pry apart the plastic enclosure. Just try to be careful as to not damage the internal PCB. There is an Adafruit Bluetooth module that you can get, but what I like about this one is you don't have to load any code or flash any firmware, it just works out of the box. This module is really small, but we can make it even smaller. You can get away without removing the switch and USB ports, and it's something I have done, but I do recommend removing them if you can. Also, do not try to desolder them like this unless you have a hot air station. My only gripe with this module is the solder pads for the USB are extremely fragile. Ripping them off is much safer. Ask me how I know. If you rip off a pad, you should be able to salvage it. I haven't lost one yet. Just take your time and try to avoid scratching the PCB. The hardest part is this chonky bit on the sides right here. Once you get through that part, you're golden. And then snip the switch off as well. If you have the room in your case, I would probably just leave all these components on, but the case on this keyboard is very cramped and I'll get into that later. And because we clipped those off, there's still some little nubs left on the solder pad, so it's good to make a pass and clean all that up. And now that we're done with that, put it off to the side, and it's time to get into removing the battery and charge circuit from the power bank. I'll be going over batteries and charge circuits much more in depth later on in the video. To get into this particular power bank, just peel off the two adhesive side covers that will reveal four little black screws. And you just undo those and then you get to prying. You pry and you pry and you pry and you pry me a river until you finally get to the chocolatey center. Once you've pried enough, you can slide the charge circuit out and then try to get something behind it. Try a screwdriver. That's kind of hard. I don't know if I want to use that. That plastic piece doesn't fit. A pen doesn't fit. I know it'll fit. A spoon. And it worked perfectly. Look at that. There is no spoon. 
Now that you've corn husked your battery bits, put it off to the side because we're obviously going to use it later. Now to fit everything, we're going to have to modify the case internals. This particular case does not leave a lot of room for internal components, especially the battery. It would fit a lot better, but there's a plastic standoff in the way. We can just take some flush cutters and clip that right off. If this case did not have these integrated channels molded into the case, there would be a lot more room for components, but we have to work around that. One snip and it's so flush, look at that. This keyboard has a bunch of other touch points inside of the case, so you're not going to lose much structural integrity. Now the battery can sit flat. The battery has to go here because there's an opening with a lip on it on the right side that has a space for the dip switches. So this is the only spot for the battery. Now the real fun starts. Wiring. I made this infographic to explain all of the wiring that I have figured out. For this tutorial I'll be using this schematic, but I would really recommend using this schematic. It's only two more wires and I'll explain the differences, but I'll be going over all of this later on in the video. It's a lot, so just use it as a reference for now. Remember that micro USB port we set aside earlier? It's time to commandeer the wires. Older USB specs are pretty simple. It's basically power, ground, data plus, and data minus. These wires come off real easy. Remove the battery charging circuit from the battery. Make sure you don't touch the black and red wires together. This will fit in the case with the USB ports on, but you can remove them if you like. Not all charge circuits are the same, and I will get into that later. But definitely this is one of the ones that I recommend using. The first part of the wiring is going from the micro USB port to the battery charging circuit. We're doing this so that we can use the existing USB port to charge the battery. And from the charge circuit, connect those leads to the micro USB port. Next, we're going to need to lengthen the battery leads. These have to be long enough to go from the battery all the way over to the charge circuit. If you have a broken or old USB cable, you can actually scavenge the wires from that. These wires are much smaller and easier to fit inside of the case, so I would recommend doing it this way. The next step is to provide power from the charge circuit to the Bluetooth module. Now we're going to take our leads from our micro USB port and solder them onto the Bluetooth module. After soldering, please reinforce these with hot glue. Now on the charging circuit, we're going to need to relocate the power switch. This is just a cheap push button micro switch. I like putting my power switch in the top right hand corner, but you're welcome to put it anywhere you like. We're relocating the switch because otherwise you'd have to open the keyboard and press the switch inside every time and that would be annoying. And lastly, we can take our battery with our now lengthened leads, plop it down on the left side, and solder it in. After that, let's test our power button, make sure everything turns on and turns off correctly. I mistakenly screwed in this micro USB port when I should have just left it out, but that's fine. The reason being is you want to test everything without buttoning everything up and setting everything down more permanently. Next we're going to try it with the keyboard attached and make sure it turns off and turns on and functions properly. Next we want to do is plug it into a wall and make sure it charges the battery correctly. The four LEDs on the charge circuit should animate as they are showing that it's getting power and also display the current battery level. And next we're going to check to make sure it can connect wirelessly through Bluetooth. And you can see it working. You can see it will charge both from the wall and also from the computer port. Now we're almost finished but we still have a few things left to do especially regarding the case. We need to drill a hole for the relocated power switch. 
The whole size is 9 64ths or just about three and a half millimeters. I'd actually recommend making this hole in the back so you don't accidentally hit it with your mouse. And just a little cleanup with an X-Acto knife. Next up are the four viewing ports. These holes are gonna allow you to see the four LEDs on the charging circuit. I did debate on where to initially put these. Since these LEDs are so bright, I figured on the bottom of the case would be the least annoying place to put them. They're not something you have to check very often, but they are useful. I suppose if you do want this on the side or the top of the case, you can run some fishing line for a cheap fiber optic effect. I'm using the blue tape as a straight edge and just referencing from the PCB itself for each hole. It's okay if the holes don't line up perfectly because the LEDs are so bright that you can still see them. The charge circuits have this flashlight function, but we don't need that, so I'm just removing that LED. Now we can finally mount everything and tack it down with some hot glue. You're going to want to go really heavy with the hot glue on the power switch. This needs to be reinforced because it's going to take multiple presses over its lifetime. I'll lay down a bit just to get the position correct, let it dry a little bit, and then cover it completely. You will need to reinforce the solder pads on the Bluetooth module. I cannot stress this enough. Now we can plug it in and test it again. I did go a little overboard with the hot glue, so I'm just cleaning up some of the holes just so I can see the LEDs through them. And here we are with all the components installed. Without modifying the case, this is the largest battery that you can fit inside. Because of that, you're going to want to protect the bottom half from actually touching the PCB. Please be careful with your battery choice as LiPo batteries can catch fire if punctured. I'm just using some of the included double stick foam as a gasket between the battery and the PCB. And some extra strips of black electrical tape for good measure. Now it's time to reconnect the PCB and assemble the case. Slide the front clips under and then just work your way around to the back clamping down all of the clips along the way. Then finish off with that singular screw. Turn it over and check out your creation. From my experience I do have some updates to this design. You can get a Type-C upgrade to the V2 keyboards. Also I would relocate the switch to the back instead of the side. I would make the LED holes even smaller and then add two more for the Bluetooth module so you can see its activity. And now some obligatory glamour shots. This project was pretty straightforward, but it did have its challenges. Mostly due from trying to fit all of the components into the confined case. I also made this much more challenging than it needed to be by trying to expand the functionality through my wiring. And I'll be going over all those steps later in this video. So does it actually work? Let's try it out. The wireless range is excellent. You can at the very least type from across the entire room, probably two or three rooms. The Bluetooth pairs quickly and I didn't notice any type of lag or any unresponsiveness. I don't know if you'd want to bring it to a competitive eSports tournament, but for most users it'd be a one-to-one -one experience to their wired keyboards. Overall in parts it cost about $50 to make. With a 3000 milliamp battery and the backlights on medium, you get about 28 hours of use per charge. Your results are going to vary depending on your keyboard, your battery, and your backlight settings. 
Now I'm going to get into the second part of the video which is more in-depth and technical. While building this I went through a ton of iterations of this circuit. In hindsight the first thing I want to stress to you is that I would not use a power bank for the battery. The reason is not all charge circuits are created equal and not every power bank comes with the same battery. If you're not using a mechanical power switch you will need a charge circuit that can turn off while a load is applied. Through my testing these blue PCB charge circuits did not turn off when a load was applied. This this will not work because the keyboard is a load and it is always connected to the charge circuit. That's why I would recommend buying the charge circuit separately that you know will turn off when the load is applied. There are ways of getting around that limitation by adding your own mechanical power switch. Now let's talk about batteries. Again in hindsight I don't think it's good to use a power bank because the case is going to determine how big of a battery you can fit inside. When you purchase a power bank you're not quite sure how big the battery inside is going to be. Of course you can modify the case to accommodate larger batteries but it's still something you want to know the dimensions of before purchasing and that's why I'd recommend buying the battery and the charge circuit separately. Obviously with more room you can stuff larger components inside the case but it might not look as nice. Here are the exact dimensions of this battery that will fit in this case. You want to be most careful with the height of the pack. The PCB is set at an angle in the case so the front of the case is going to have the least room and run out very quickly so the height of the pack is very important. Bigger batteries mean bigger run times but at the expense of internal space. My original concept was just to make a wired keyboard wireless, but I started thinking what if you also wanted it to be wired. I added a mechanical slider switch to toggle between wired and wireless. This worked well but now you have two switches instead of one elegant switch. I then had a big brain moment where I thought what if I hijack the internal flashlight LED switch. This was somewhat of a failure because there's only 50 milliamps on that LED circuit. So my next thought was what if I use it to flip a relay. This blue relay didn't work because I needed it to switch power and not ground. Thankfully my neighbor is an electronics genius and he was able to give me these tiny little relays that fit the bill. And that's when I ran into my next issue. The keyboard would charge just fine when plugging into the wall, but when I plugged it into the computer it started flip-flopping back and forth between the wired and wireless connection on its own. This didn't make any sense to me because the relay was actually cutting power to the Bluetooth module. So how is it trying to use the Bluetooth when there's no power going to it? This flip-flopping issue was very frustrating and after lots of experimentation I finally figured out what was causing this problem. It was the white data line in the USB cable that was actually carrying a current that was causing this problem. With both data lines tied together from the keyboard and the USB port, the Bluetooth module and the computer are basically fighting over who has control over the keyboard. One workaround was to splice the data lines off of your USB charge cable. This was not the ideal solution. What if I can move that separation inside the keyboard case? Thankfully my little relay has more pins on it. So along with the power switching, I'm also able to split the white data line. Now when double tapping the power switch, you can charge from the wall and the computer without it causing a problem. All while also being able to toggle between wired and wireless connections. And here I am demonstrating that. You can charge from the computer with a regular data cable with no issues. If you prefer a mechanical switch and don't want to use a relay, you can add a slider switch in place of what the relay is doing. Being able to go from wired to wireless and back was definitely the most challenging part of this project. There are just a lot of different scenarios and states for what you want your keyboard to do. There's wired charging from the wall, wireless charging from the wall, wired charging from the computer, and wireless charging from the computer. Then trying to get all that to work off one elegant switch. This final schematic is how I would actually recommend wiring up your keyboard. The Bluetooth module actually comes with a firmware switch which will allow you to toggle between wired and wireless. There are some caveats however for wiring it this way. One is that the firmware switch acts like a bridge so it's not a direct connection. This will cause problems for things like when you go to update the firmware of your keyboard. Another drawback is when going through the firmware bridge it is also going to limit you to 6 key rollover. If your keyboard supports native N key rollover then you will have to give that up. Even with these two limitations it is still my recommended way of doing it because the wiring is dead simple and it's easy to implement. And finally if you want the ultimate schematic you're going to need two relays. 
The newer WASD V3 keyboards require you to disconnect not only the white USB data line, but also the green one. If you're having trouble getting this to work on your keyboard, this might be the problem. I modified a different keyboard, which I'll be making a video about later, and I also ran into this issue where I needed to disconnect both the white and the green data lines. Even though the wiring is much more complicated, you do get the benefits of a direct connection, so you can update your firmware on your keyboard, and also you get the end key rollover. With all this info, you should be able to successfully convert your USB keyboard to wireless. I'm going to show you how I custom painted and upgraded my workstation ThinkPad. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope that you found some enjoyment from all of this information that I've presented for you today. If you do use this tutorial and you're inspired to create your own wireless conversion, please let me know and show it to me because I'd love to check it out. Thanks again for watching and I will see you in the next one.